And our scripture today, it comes from Zechariah, the ninth chapter. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And from Luke 19. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, colt the owner asked them, why are you untying this colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout out. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So it's Palm Sunday. Hosanna! Oh, some of you know the exact, that's right. According to tradition, the proper response when somebody shouts Hosanna on Palm Sunday is Hosanna in the highest. So Hosanna! Hosanna! Now, do you have any idea what you just shouted? Hosanna, what does that mean? Any ideas? I mean, you just shouted that and you don't, oh, yeah? Christ, is definitely lifting up Christ in the highest, definitely, acknowledging he's up there. And Hosanna literally means, save us, save us. So what does, then somebody asked me between services, well, then what does save us in the highest mean? Well, come on, we all have expressions for that, right? Save my behind, you know, right? There's, <laughs> they're all shouting, save our behinds, right there. They're, they have been long under oppression. They've been waiting for the Messiah, and they seem to have the... the the, the sense that Jesus is the one. You know, this, this painting really doesn't do justice to that kind of level of excitement, does it? They, they look like they're being paraded what, to, to their bedrooms to sleep or something. <laughs> you know, not very realistic. At least they could have put it on a hill, created some drama, drama there maybe, but you know, we ought to try a, a different uh, depiction. Um, how about, uh, oh yeah, that's perfect. Oh, Jesus showed up in time for high tea at Castle Jerusalem on his donkey. <laughs> Ah, how about this? There we go. Now there's, there's some excitement. There's some vibrancy. There's, there's some drama there. Now, if you were on the top of the hill of the Mount of Olives 2,000 years ago, who would you have been if you were there? Would you have been perhaps one of Jesus' disciples who had long been awaiting for this day, just ready to introduce Jerusalem to the Chosen One? full of excitement, maybe a little fear and trepidation as well? Or would you have been one of those palm-waving crowds, you know, wondering who is this mysterious guy who's going to save us and very excited about the possibilities? Or would you have been maybe one of the people who literally took off your cloak and laid it before uh, Jesus' feet and before that donkey signaling you're all ready to uh, obey him as your king? Now, if you were a palm ra raver, I'm, I'm sorry, you're actually not in today's store. That's uh, Matthew's version. This is, this is Luke's. Luke only knows about the, the cloak layers, but let's assume they, they were both right. So we can all be together on Palm Sunday. Okay, so there's all of us there. You know, 
through all those different perspectives, I never hear anybody saying, well, if I were there, I would have been the jackass, the donkey, right? Nobody ever preaches about the donkey. You know, but I would suggest that that donkey could teach us a lot about Christian discipleship and following our calling in life. And I'm convinced that by the time you leave, you will want nothing better to be a jackass for Jesus. <laughs> and the reason I, you know, one of the, the first things that the donkey teaches us, now Jesus identifies kind of who this donkey is. He, he says, you will find, to his disciples, you will find a donkey that's never been ridden. You know, now, does that seem like a logical thing? You're going to get on the back of a donkey who's never been ridden, ride it down this really steep hill full of co slippery cobblestones with crowd going wild like, like rivaling a Nebraska Huskers game all the way around and throwing stuff at this, this poor beast's feet even. Is that really the greatest idea? But there was a method to Jesus' madness. You heard it coming from the prophecy of the prophet Zechariah this morning. Israel had long awaited a king who was predicted to arise who would enter Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. In fact, on the back of a young donkey. Given the fact it had never been ridden, you know it's pretty young, inexperienced. So Jesus is making an overt bid for kingship on Palm Sunday. No mistake about it. It's like neon sign, proclaim me king or kill me. So, what would you have, how, how would you have responded if you were in the donkey's place? I mean, you, here you are just minding your own business, comfortably tethered to your safe place at home, and then these perfect strangers come up, they take you to this place, and put you before this ter terrifying hill, and this guy you've never met before maybe pets you on the nose and gets on you and ready to ride. How would you have responded? Well, think about how you, would have, how you have responded. To situations where people, uh, you call you into some, a course of action where you have never done it before and thus have no experience to guide you. When people have asked something of you that puts you at the center of public attention and scrutiny. When people ask something of you that directly engages you with larger issues whose significance you don't fully understand. When people have set you in contact with people whose behaviors you have a difficult time interpreting, and when you're exposed to all kinds of supporters and foes that you never had to face when your life was comfortably tethered back home, how would you have responded? Jesus saying, let's ride. Okay. No, for that donkey to take one step over the, 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 the crest of that hill and make his way down, he had to have been respond, responded. Here's the first thing we learned from being a ja about being a jackass for Jesus. He had to respond from his nature rather than his sense of neediness. He, had, he couldn't have been so absorbed by what he lacked to get down that hill and had to respond to some inner sense that connected him with what he was perceived to be doing with his basic nature as, as a donkey. Now, I don't say that just of my own authority. I have, uh, actually, we have sought far and wide uh, to consult with the highest authorities for this worship service this morning. In fact, I'd like to introduce to you uh, a member, the, the president, I think, and CEO of the American Association for uh, uh, Mule and Donkey Society or something like that. I, I don't know. Come on, come on forward, friend. <laughs> You look like you've come from a long way. Let me get you a microphone here. If you can, Nick, can you? Oh, here, I'll take Let me take This may be hot. Watch out. Oh, Ooh, it is hot. Am I on? Yeah. What, what's in there? Oh, uh, no, don't, don't ask. Don't answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what's your name? Uh, I'm Aaron. You look like a Roy to me. A <laughs> Roy. And, and you? Use my mic. Who are you? You guys are together? Yeah. Oh, well. well. <laughs> <laughs> <So> okay. <Steve. laughs> Boy, you ever try to wear these things? <clears throat> now, 
My name is, are you ready for this? Donk Mueller. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> and I represent the American Donkey and Mule Society. Now, I was in the barn yesterday, and I got wind of your, your program. So I thought I'd come down and try to set you straight. Because uh, if this is going to be a put down of these beautiful beasts, or you're going to make fun of them, you're going to have to deal with my society. How many people are near your society? As of this morning, three of us. Now, let me give you some background. Uh, I used the word, I wrote it down, but I forgot. Et, 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 ma, what is it? Etymology? Etymology. I like words I can't spell. Anyway, let me give you the Latin derivation here. The word for jackass is a sinus. A-S-U-I-N-S. And equus, E-Q-U-U-S. So equus, a sinus, is a donkey, a mule, a burl, and a jackass. How about that, huh? Now, listen carefully. Let me tell you a little bit about jackasses. They're loving. How about a hug? <laughs> They're loving. They're intelligent. And they work hard. And they have a sense of humor. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, those Australians started using the word arse. You familiar with the word arse? That's a, yeah. And it was used to put people down because it referred to our backsides. If you were an arse, you were supposed to be stupid or dumb. That's not the case. That's not the case. Jackasses, or you can call them jennies, too. If you're going to be inclusive, you should probe this program. Jackasses and jennies for Jesus. But you can just use jackasses for Jesus if you do it right. Now, as a member of the society, we're proud of our asses. Some are small. Some are a little larger. But our animals are intelligent. Listen to this carefully now. Do you know your Bible? You ever read the Bible? Occasionally. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. You ever heard of Balaam? How many heard of Balaam? Boy, nobody here reads the Bible. Balaam had a donkey that was so intelligent he could speak. He was a real smart ass. <laughs> now, if you're going to have this program, what I want you to do is remember that you are loving, you are gentle and kind, you have a sense of humor, I mean, and Guy. <laughs> and you work really hard. So you have the support of my entire organization. You go ahead. You have your jackass for Jesus. And we support you 100, 100%. 100 and I'm proud to be here to help you with that program. By the way, out in your Nerthex out there, there's a list. You can sign up. I will do a seminar for jackasses anytime you want. Just Give me a call. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We'll keep Thank that you. in mind. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> Thank you. So where have uh, you uh, found uh, you yourself resisting the Spirit's call uh, simply because you are focused on your neediness? You could be focusing on your nature.
The Poet Thinks on the Donkey by Mary Oliver. On the outskirts of Jerusalem, the donkey waited. Not especially brave or filled with understanding, he stood and waited. How horses turned out into the meadow leap with delight, and how doves released from their cages clatter away, splashed with sunlight. But the donkey, tied to a tree as usual, waited. Then he let himself be led away. Then he let the stranger mount. Never had he seen such crowds, and I wonder if he had all imagined what was to happen. Still, he was what he had always been, small, dark, obedient. I hope, finally, he felt brave. I hope, finally, he loved the man who rode so lightly upon him as he lifted one dusty hoof and stepped, as he had to, forward. Uh, Jack asked, Brave was responding from his nature, not his neediness. Uh, you know, it's kind of that way with all of us. Once we finally uh, get that, that sense that, that that's which is calling us forward is actually inviting us to be more fully human, um, to more fully appear as ourselves in this world, it's, it's really kind of a decision about do we follow kind of into the great unknown or do we shrink away and say, I'm not quite ready to be me yet. I'm not quite ready to follow you yet. But we always feel inadequate. It always. I mean, if we didn't feel inadequate, we would just be onto our path long ago, right? Um, but there's a sense in which the, our call in life is always connected to larger things because it's connected to God. And God is connected to larger currents and cross currents and connecting us to those things that we, we don't fully understand. And so we have this native intuition that if we are to follow where we sense the call, we are fundamentally incapable of achieving it on our own. So the donkey might remind us, hey, take a look at me. I had Jesus on my back. Jesus had my back. He has your back. That's why you will be capable of doing this. So respond from your nature, not your neediness, but also get over the fact that you just aren't equipped. If you'll just keep two principles in mind, you can follow that call uh, without prior experience. This is something the donkey teaches us as well. I mean, in order to make, get Jesus down the hill safely, the donkey would have had to have been entirely focused on his task rather than all distracted by the crowds, but also flexible knowing that, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in his way and stuff that he'd never encountered before, ways of moving that he hadn't done before. He had to stay focused and also very, very flexible. That's the principle if you want to be a jackass for Jesus. Stay focused on that call, but also flexible in your application of it. It's also how you put yourself into that call, merely just following. You actually do a bit of a dance with that call. You can experience that this morning if you'd like. How many of you feel qualified, for instance, to uh, balance a peacock feather on your, your finger? I mean, think you could do that? Well, you can if you do two things. One, focus your attention on the eye of that feather to keep it locked there and then keep your body flexible. Watch this. Yeah, no problem. Think now, okay, oh, oh, no, no, don't. Think I can balance this on my nose? Well, let's see, without falling off the chancel. Focused and flexible. There we go. All right, now you get up. You try. You just, just try really hard out. Try it on your finger. Try it on your nose if you'd like. You can even toss the feather back and forth. You keep an open hand. Toss it back and forth. Let's give it a try. Let's be focused and flexible as... Yeah. Hey, good job. That's a good one. Want to toss? Okay. 
Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> Could all be jackasses for Jesus. And from Ann Weems, the way. The way to Jerusalem looks suspiciously like Highway 40. And the pilgrims look suspiciously like you and me. I expected the road to Jerusalem to be crowded with holy people, clerics, and saints. People who have kindness wrinkled in their faces and comfort lingering in their voices. But this is more like rush hour. Horns blowing, people pushing, voices cursing. This is not what I envisioned. Oh God, I've only begun and I already feel like I've lost my way. Surely this is not the road, and surely these are not the ones who are to travel with me. This Lenten journey calls for holy retreat, for reflection and repentance. Instead of holiness, the highway is crammed with a cacophony of chaos. Is there no back road to Jerusalem? No quiet path where angels tend to weary travelers? No sanctuary from the noise of the world? Just this? Can this hectic highway be the highway to heaven? I want to share a story of God in my life and how God makes his presence known in a case where you might think Life is filled with serendipity, but as I've discovered, it really isn't. You know, God has a greater role in things. During the month of 9-11, I had been part of a group of people that planned for about a year and a half to take a medical mission trip to the Dominican Republic. And it was an eye trip where we had uh, physicians, optometrists, opticians, and uh, folks filling a whole variety of different roles in about five consecutive days of different clinics in the Santa Domingo area and then as well on the last day a, a very rural location. Well in the first four days we were able to meet people's needs very easily. We had a lot of glasses, we were able to meet medical needs with prescription drugs, with the physicians who were making recommendations of treatment that people might need. But the last day when we packed up on the fourth day before getting ready to do this rural example, we looked at the glasses we had and said, boy, we have next to nothing here. We have the oddest array of glasses. And, you know, there was some prayer about where it was at. And the next morning we got up and loaded a bus and went out to a rural area. And as not serendipity would have it, but as God's action would bring, people who needed that which we had to give. Uh, people who came who had, as we would look at the prescription eyeglasses or medical conditions, odd needs, unique needs, of which we were able to fill each and every one. And as the day went on, we looked at each other more and more going, what's going on here? It's not serendipity. It's God in action in our lives, taking care of us at a time when the world changed in a matter of actions of a few individuals that the world was wondering, what are we about? How can we take care of each other? And at a time when we went out of our own country to another country where people were in need, and what looked like we had nothing to offer to others was everything that everybody needed. God's love in action. I love Mark's story because it tells us something about uh, what we've been talking about, how to be a, the perfect... Uh, jackass for Jesus. <laughs> he and his team go to this country far away, responding to their nature, you know, aligning with their nature as, as people of compassion, right? Not worried about all their, their neediness. As they get on the ground, they have to respond in real time, stay focused on their task, and yet flexible to those, those changing conditions. And 
Then when they discovered that you know, by that third day they'd run out of all the standard stuff and only had the oddities left over to go to their fourth place, they kind of despaired, didn't they? Um, and yet uh, that third lesson of, from the jackass this morning maybe uh, provide a way into interpreting what they did. That jackass getting Jesus down the mountain, you know, he was connected to some pretty wide, you know, some pretty big causes, right? I mean, Jesus' bid for kingship, you know, the, the future of the world, all those things were, were right, literally, right, was literally riding on his shoulders. And if that jackass could have predicted what, how all the events that would transpire in Holy Week, he probably would have despaired by Good Friday, thinking he, he had wasted his efforts, that he had met his calling and now it had come to nothing. But the story of the jackass on a Palm Sunday reminds us of the third principle. He was called just to get Jesus down the hill. That's it. Let Jesus worry about the rest. Just get him down the hill. And so Mark and his company. That's all they were called to do was show up with the stuff they had and let God worry about the rest. And sure enough, all those needs were met in ways that they never could have anticipated. Every week here, we remind ourselves of just this thing as we celebrate the gifts of this table gifts that we'll be celebrating this Thursday as well in the Last Supper. We are reminded that uh, had we been one of those disciples, kind of like you know, thinking this was finally the time had come, this is now the moment of opportunity, expecting Jerusalem to open its gates wide and to open its arms and its hearts wide to the new Messiah and only to find Jesus hung on a cross by the end of the week. I'm sure that they had to remind themselves that their task wasn't to do all the work for Jesus. They simply had to be faithful. Even faithful as his body was broken. Faithful even as his blood was shed. Their calling, like ours, did not depend upon their vision of what their work was coming about, but God's vision of what the work was about coming about. Literally, their purpose and ours is fulfilled when we simply take bread, dip it in the cup, and as we take this into ourselves, remind ourselves of who we are and whose we are and whose work we bear in this world. Stay close to our purpose. Stay close to that next step and truly let God worry about the rest. You do not have to be a member of Countryside Community Church or, or subscribe to any particular dogma or doctrine to come forward to this table. All that we ask is if your heart calls you forward, know that you are most welcome here. So likewise, if you prefer to receive communion from your seat, simply raise your hand as a deacon passes and you'll be served there. Or if you prefer not to participate at all, know that that's okay too. In whatever way you join us this morning, we welcome you here. But if you do come forward, we do invite you to take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup. And perhaps as you dip, take this into yourself, you will also be reminded that all you need to follow is the next step you're called to make. And that's it. Let God worry about the rest. The gifts of God for the people of God. As the deacons come forward to prepare the feast, let us remind ourselves of who we are and whose we are. We are an open and affirming family of faith, welcoming all to God's table of love and acceptance. We are diverse, yet united by Christ's example. We care for one another, support one another, and challenge one another to be all, all that God creates us to be. We work together to nurture our community and to promote peace and justice in our conflicted world. Amen.